Vanakam Doha Devan everyone, nice to be with you today. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviyam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Ma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And we will attempt to share the screen. And we have February 26th today in Asia. <clears throat> And our first topic is answering some questions sent in to satsang at hindu.org. <clears throat> our app, such as the Sadhana phone app, where puja can be done digitally, appropriate to use for home worship. If so, when should they be used? For example, when we don't have space in our homes or when we are traveling? Answer. The puja chants on our apps are just for learning purposes and not intended to be used during an actual home puja. If you don't have space to do puja at home, then you wouldn't do puja. When traveling, japa is an important practice that works in any space. Next question. In a couple of different places, Gurudeva emphasizes that when we are irritated with someone, parents, colleagues, over some behavior. That is really because we are imperfect in that respect ourselves. We have the same tendencies that are suppressed. Can Bodhinata please explain this idea better and how we can reduce this tendency to react negatively? Answer. The signposts are that it is a much larger emotional reaction than you customarily have. And it is how you consistently respond to a situation even though the people involved are different. In other words, sometimes if your father does something, you respond one way, but if someone else does it, you don't respond the same way. This is not the case here. No matter who does it, you respond the same way. For example, when you were young, you smoked cigarettes and managed to stop for health reasons when you were about 25 years old. However, you still have a strong desire to smoke that is suppressed. This causes you to react strongly when you see people smoking and criticize them mentally. It is overcome by cognizing the nature of the suppression of wanting to smoke cigarettes again. So we need an insight. We need to see our suppressed desire. And the seeing of it eliminates this condition. It's not suppressed anymore. It doesn't mean the desire goes away, but it's not suppressed and it's not creating this criticism and emotional reaction to other people. Second topic. Recently, I had a conversation with a devotee on the importance of being a good listener. I thought I would share those thoughts with everyone by presenting the publisher's desk, The Art of Listening, which has the subtitle, With the modern distraction of digital media, we must be more mindful than ever of person-to-person -person communications. In other words, Nowadays, the norm is you're talking to someone and they're also looking at their smartphone at the same time. And that's supposed to be acceptable listening. And this publisher's desk was written to point out to Hindu parents and youth the prevalence of digital distraction in modern life. It's common to listen to someone while doing something else, such as sending a digital communication. 
The art of listening also relates to sensitivity, as seen in this example from our last Zoom satsang. Second situation, at a meditation retreat, everyone is asked to share insights. As each one speaks, you, sensitivity, watch facial expressions and body language, as well as the words being spoken. So that is really a good listener. You're not only hearing the words, you're also seeing the facial expressions and the body language, which could tell you that the person is saying the opposite of what he or she means, or is leaving out an important part of it. So you can only tell that by watching the facial expressions and the body language. Insensitivity, tune out, figuring this is the time to think about what you are going to say, not to listen to them. And back to our publisher's desk. Going to talk about Shruti. So, question to you is what does Shruti mean? The answer is not on the next slide, but it comes up in a couple of slides. <coughs> Sound is regarded as divine in Hinduism, so it is fitting that listening is always held a central role in the faith. Our core scriptures, the Vedas and Agamas, are referred to as Shruti, which means that which is heard, not which that not that which is read, that which is heard, as they were originally heard by rishis as an oral transmission directly from God. In the early days of human civilization, prior even to writing, Shruti was faithfully preserved without alteration, important because this is the word of God, by means of oral instruction from Guru to Shishya. This went on generation after generation for thousands of years. Considering the vast body of texts, it is remarkable that this was achieved. And more remarkable still when you know it was accomplished by requiring students to learn each verse in 11 different ways, including backwards. Fortunately, this traditional way of teaching the Vedas and Agamas by listening is still practiced in today's priest training schools. In a typical learning session, the teacher chants a verse once, then the students as a group recite it twice striving to be faithful to the subtleties of pronunciation and rhythm they hear in the teacher's chanting. This is not a now and again thing. The recitations go on for long hours every day and every day for years and years. Students begin young as early as five when memory is strong. Anyone who has seen a great documentary knows how powerful the human voice is as an instrument for communication and sharing of knowledge. So much more effective than reading. Consider Pravachan, the popular lectures given by teachers who have personally experienced the truths they are explaining. In these dynamic discourses, the teacher presents the essentials of the Vedas, Upanishads and other scriptures, and those who listen absorb those deep teachings with all other senses from one who knows. In this sharing, this speaking and hearing, subtle knowledge is transmitted from knower to seeker in a way that cannot be matched by reading. Multiple levels of information are conveyed through such speech, inflection, emotion, emphasis, conviction, and subtle intimations. Gurudeva wrote on this idea. Because sound is the first creation, knowledge is transferred through sound of all kinds. It is important that one listen to the highest truths of a Sampradaya from one who has realized them. The words, of course, will be familiar. They have been read by the devotee literally hundreds of times. But to hear them from the mouth of the enlightened Rishi is to absorb his unspoken realization. As he re realizes his realization, while he reads them and speaks them out. 
And a question to you. How should we listen to a mystically profound subject? What do we need to do on our side to get the most out of a mystically profound subject? I like to think of listening as an art. The idea is that to fully grasp the subject being presented requires attentiveness to the speaker, concentration on the meaning of what is being said. For a mystically profound subject, intuition is also needed to deeply understand what the speaker means, a meaning that lies beyond his words. When, attentiveness concentration, and intuition are all present. So those are the three. Attentiveness, concentration, intuition. Listening becomes an art. This is as true today as it was 2,200 years ago when a village weaver wrote the ethical masterpiece Tirukkural. He devotes a full chapter, 10 couplets, to learning by listening. Here are three of Tiruvalluvar's verses. In heaven, deities feed from sacrificial fires. That's well written. On earth, men who feast on listening are their equal. The most precious wealth is the wealth acquired by the ear. Indeed, of all wealth, that wealth is paramount. If not pierced by acute listening, Ears may hear and yet remain deaf. As we all know, the art of listening faces a new challenge in our modern age, digital distraction. Computers and mobile phones and the constant stream of the stimuli they offer profoundly challenge everyone's abilities to focus, listen, and learn. A New York Times article entitled Growing Up Digital wired for distraction, address the issue. Researchers say the lure of these technologies, while it affects adults too, is particularly powerful for young people. The risk, they say, is that developing brains can become more easily habituated than adult brains to constantly switching tasks. Constantly switching tasks, becoming less able to sustain attention their brains are rewarded not for staying on task, but for jumping to the next thing, said Michael Rich, an associate professor, Harvard Medical School, and executive director of the Center on Media and Child Health in Boston. And the effects could linger. The worry is we're raising a generation of kids in front of screens whose brains are going to be wired differently. That's a great photograph, huh? All those distractions at once. This was written in 2010. Since then, the number of smartphone users in the US alone has tripled. So that's a 2015 statistic, way out of date. In any public place, it seems everyone is carrying a phone and accessing it often. It could be called digital addiction, which is a form of digital distraction in the extreme. The Times article goes on to say that researchers have found that students' use of technology is not uniform. Their choices tend to reflect their personalities. Social butterflies tend to be heavy texters and Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram users. Students who are less social may escape into games. While drifters or those prone to procrastination might surf the web or watch videos. The Hindu home is crucially impacted by digital distraction. 
Important Hindu teachings, its principles, stories, and ethics are traditionally conveyed to young children by their grandparents. Parents communicate what is needed for their teenage children to understand the new duties that are maturing into. They are maturing into. Parents also regularly share information about current happenings in the family and future plans. All this person-to-person -person communication is impeded when family members turn constantly to the digital world and stop having meaningful conversations with one another. A common sight these days is a family sitting together with each member fixated on his or her phone or tablet with no talking or listening taking place. Though they share the same room, their minds are elsewhere. So that's a good photograph for that idea. It would be unwise to allow digital information to overwhelm us even more than life's modern conveniences already have. The Amish, the small religious community in the U.S., have taken an extreme stand against modernism living as people did two centuries ago in an effort to preserve their culture and perpetuate their religion. One documentary tells the story of an Amish family that eliminated all possibilities for modern distractions, including digital, by having no electricity in the home. For most of us, that would be too radical. A more balanced solution for Hindu families is to set, establish set times for digital study and enjoyment, and other times for healthy in-person communication with family members and friends, with digital devices turned off. Recently, a young Hindu couple proudly told me that digital devices are banned from the dinner table in their home, a simple rule that is enriching their interactions and strengthening their relationships. A number of families have reined in digital distractions by requiring that their children's computers remain in the living room where family members can provide oversight. Others have found tools to restrain where their children can go online. For his devotees, Gurudeva designated Monday as a family home evening, time for sharing among family members. On Monday evening, Shiva's day, the family members get together, prepare a wonderful meal, play games together, and verbally appreciate one another's good qualities. They don't solve any problems on that day. They just love each other, and everybody has a voice, from the littlest child to the oldest senior. Television and all digital devices are turned off. It's a time for listening, real listening. Being a good listener can lead to being a good conversationalist, another fine art jeopardized by digital distraction. I developed a simple sadhana called supportive conversation to strengthen bonds with a family member or friend. Here it is. It consists of four actions. What do you think the four actions are? One, stop what you are doing when approached. Smile, face the person, extend a kind greeting and give him or her your full attention. Put down or turn off your mobile device. Two, listen carefully. Do not interrupt. Concentrate on what is being said. If it is troublesome to you, remember the adage, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Get engaged and show support by responding sincerely and constructively. Three, especially if the person is sharing an emotional experience, ask him or her to recount the event. Be patient, listen with all of your senses. If you feel it is taking too long, affirm mentally that you have all the time in the world. Four, practice empathy. Put yourself in the other person's place. If you were speaking, you would want others to fully listen. Remember, you don't have to provide solutions, just a caring ear. Your hearing the story is enough.
And a summary, perhaps the art of listening will enjoy a comeback with the help of digital media. As the word spreads virally on what we miss without it, listening is how we most naturally learn. It is a skill that needs to be perpetuated, even honed from generation to generation. Parents need to carefully guide their children's development to avoid digital distraction. Develop the listening art and hopefully, if all goes well, awaken intuition and compassion for others. Adults need to make sure they themselves are not indulging excessively in a digital world. This will ensure that the knowledge and practices of Hinduism continue to thrive in this digital era. Third topic, before we start the third topic, add, a, add on to the last topic, There's no slide, just something I thought of at the last moment. <clears throat> has to do with meetings. A common attitude if you're going to a meeting, say with four or five other people, is you prepare your best idea, you take it to the meeting, you present your idea, and the meeting is a success if your idea is accepted. So nothing wrong with that approach but it's limiting the possibilities. So in the spirit of the art of listening, a better approach is you take your best idea to the meeting, you encourage everyone else to take their best ideas, you listen carefully to the ideas presented, and the ideal is you come up with a new idea that no one thought of that's even better than any of the ideas brought to the meeting. So that's a creative meeting and requires everyone really, really being good at the art of listening, which includes using your intuition. And our third topic as usual, sharing, which is the 55th character quality from our workbook. How would you define sharing? That's a really easy one. The workbook gives this definition. Sharing means giving to others a portion of what one has or receives. I cultivate it by not keeping everything for myself, but including others in the enjoyment of my gifts and possessions. The opposite is hoarding. First quote from Gurudeva. Charity is selfless concern and caring for our fellow man. It is generous giving without thought of reward, always sharing and never hoarding. We cultivate charity through giving to the hungry, the sick, the homeless, the elderly, and the unfortunate. In other words, we give to all in need that we encounter in our normal life activities. Second quote. What is help anyway but man sharing with man? Who is the helper and who is the one who is helped? You can ponder what Gurudeva means by that. And our example is comparing the actions of one who shares to one who hoards. First situation, when you receive a small bequest from a grandfather who passed away, you share and give a portion to God before spending any. Hoarding, keep it all and purchase new things you wanted for a long time. Second situation, when mother hands you a plate of fresh cookies she made you. Sharing, go around the house, putting, giving a few to everyone so all can enjoy the treat. Hoarding, take the sweets to your room where you can munch on them all day when you get hungry. Third situation, when a longtime friend visits and admires your collection of roses, you. Sharing. Get a small shovel from the garden shed and dig up the one she admired the most. Hoarding, tell yourself the roses were so hard to acquire it would be a shame to start giving them away. Reflection, take a moment to identify a few ways in which you could improve in sharing.
and the assignment. <clears throat> For the next two weeks, focus on opportunities to practice the art of sharing. Give to others whenever you get the chance, trusting you will always have enough. Oh, thank you very much. Oh. Oh.